The following review for Ratchet and Clank will analyse the entire game in depth. Those who have played the game will get the most out of this video. Ratchet and Clank was developed by Insomniac Games and released in 2002 for the PlayStation 2. The game is a 3D platformer, similar to Insomniac's previous Spyro the Dragon series, but with a new emphasis on gunplay and shooting mechanics. The game opens with Ratchet working on his ship, unable to add the final component. Clank, meanwhile, has just come off the assembly line and is chased down by some guard robots after seeing something he wasn't supposed to. He crashes his ship on Ratchet's home planet and the game begins. Immediately after the gameplay starts, tutorial pop-ups like this begin displaying. These pop-ups aren't exactly the most elegant way to get a tutorial across. However, this does at least have the benefit of making this level not feel too much like a tutorial on repeat playthroughs, since these can be skipped or turned off entirely. Ratchet and Clank was Insomniac's first game since coming off the Spyro the Dragon series, which had relatively simple movement mechanics to match the light-hearted tone and intended audience. Ratchet and Clank is considerably more complex, so it's understandable that Insomniac wanted to be better safe than sorry with these tutorials, but they probably should have been integrated into the level design, rather than breaking up the flow to tell the player how to play the game outright. While we're here, I might as well say something about bolts, the currency of the game. I don't actually have a whole lot to say about them, just that they're surprisingly enjoyable to collect, the sound effect when collecting them is satisfying, and overall they serve their purpose well. These enemies here effectively encourage use of the bomb glove, as their attacks have a longer reach than Ratchet's wrench, but a shorter range than Ratchet's bombs. This brief opening level ends with Ratchet taking Clank back home. Clank wakes up and explains that he wants help in finding someone to save the galaxy, his first choice for that job being Captain Quark. Clank shows Ratchet the infobot he picked up earlier, and on it Supreme Executive Chairman Drek explains this evil scheme setting him up as the game's antagonist. His home planet has been polluted, and he is building a new planet for his race, the Blarg, out of bits and pieces of other ideal planets. He's a fairly typical villain with a pretty uninspiring visual design, but I do think that for a game of this style it's a fairly novel evil scheme, and provides sufficient impetus for the game's events. Clank happens to be able to operate Ratchet's ship, and they leave Ratchet's home planet to find Captain Quark. There's some small foreshadowing here that you're likely to miss first time through. Clank gets his name. You got a name? My serial number is B54296. Oops! I'll just call you Clank for short! Hang on! And Ratchet crashes the ship on Novalis, where the game finally lets up on the cutscenes. Oh, oh. Oh, Clank? Where are you? <laughs> oh, sorry about that. For a platformer, it's rather cutscene heavy at the start, but thankfully this becomes less of an issue going forward. Every cutscene is also skippable, which is always appreciated. The enemies in this stage are very similar to those in the first. They're dangerous to try to melee, but are easy to take out with the bomb glove. This guy gives the duo a ship and coordinates to the next level, but there's a second set of coordinates to be found in this level before leaving. Most levels in Ratchet and Clank contain more than one objective, with linear paths leading to each. Laying a level out like this is nothing groundbreaking to be sure, but gives the player more options and gives them recourse if they get stuck somewhere, so it's commendable all the same. Ratchet and Clank meet the plumber for the first time here, and somehow he'll end up sticking around for the entire series. Look, the plumber's back. There's also this path behind the ship where the player can learn how to swim and get a gold bolt, but going through here isn't required. Essentially, this is just another easy level to ensure the player has a good grasp on the mechanics before the game starts increasing the difficulty. Metropolis is up next, which is perhaps the most iconic of the original game's levels, and it's the one Insomniac returned to the most in the sequels. After talking to the Quark bot, 
Captain Cork Fitness Course. The player is sent through a literal obstacle course to get the swing shot. Here, Insomniac clearly wanted to lampoon the idea of tutorials and games often feeling like obstacle courses by putting an actual, literal obstacle course in the game. But the developers clearly had their priorities right by making an enjoyable part of the game first and a tongue-in-cheek piece of design second. Listen up, you lard balls! That was the most pathetic display I have ever seen on that obstacle course! After being lambasted by Helga and made to pay for the swing shot, the other route in this level leads to the Halipack. I think this is as good a time as any to talk about the game's graphics. There's actually quite a lot going on in Metropolis's skybox, with plenty of ships flying around, all of which are actually destructible and not just window dressing, and a ton of buildings in the background. I'm not going to claim this is still astounding stuff today, but it's clear that Insomniac took the time to understand the PS2's hardware and get the best they could out of it. It's telling that every level opens up with the camera pulled back to show as much of the stage as possible. While the game definitely shows its age now, I doubt anything from 2002 with realistic graphical stylings has held up even remotely as well. So now that we've cleared that up, what can I do for you? Our upgrades clank with the Halipack, significantly expanding the player's moveset. This is a good time to discuss the game's various actions that the player can perform, and it might help to shed some light on those earlier tutorials. In the first Ratchet and Clank, including the moves the backpack upgrades add, Ratchet can Swing the Wrench Piper Strike Comet Strike Jump Double Jump Boost Jump Glide Stretch Jump Fire Weapons Hover Strafe and swim. For comparison's sake, in Spyro 3, without context specific power ups, Spyro could jump, breathe fire, charge, glide, hover, and swim. This added complexity may explain why Insomniac were so willing to include so many written tutorials, and why moves like the Halipax are staggered out throughout the game. It's worth noting that the Spyro games never required the player to press more than one button at once to execute a move. In Ratchet, Comet Strikes, Boost Jumps, Stretch Jumps and Strafing all require the player to hold a shoulder button and press a face button. This may seem a simplistic thing to bring up in this day and age, but coming off the simple early 3D platformers of the PlayStation 1 era, Insomniac probably wanted to ensure that players weren't overwhelmed by input options, and the overwrought tutorials seem a bit more understandable. After this train, which has a surprisingly good sense of forward momentum for the time, this infobot provides coordinates to Eudora. There's now the option to go to Iridia or Eudora, and this is another thing I appreciate about Ratchet & Clank's progression. Along with multiple paths and objectives in every level, players often have two choices as to which planet they'd like to visit next. Again, not astounding stuff, but having more options is still appreciated. The Trespasser is obtained here on Iridia, which would have to be my favourite door opening minigame in a series which has had plenty. The level gives one objective that can't be completed until later as well, which will become a common theme from this point on. The enemy design begins to stumble here on Eudora. The developers can no longer use the enemies to teach the player how to use any given weapon, because the player can now choose which weapons to buy or not buy. Visually, all the designs are great, but now that the designers have to start compensating for every possible loadout, unique attacks that guide the player towards using a specific weapon are few and far between. After grabbing the suck cannon and having a climactic battle with the commander, The duo head off to the Blarg station. This level contains the game's first Clank section. It would have been fair to expect Clank gameplay to crop up at some point, but if memory serves this actually came as a pleasant surprise to me on my first playthrough all those years ago. This is a very short section and serves as a quick introduction to the Gadgetbots. Here they get introduced but don't see much use as a puzzle mechanic. The player only has to order them to attack and then enter a gate. The Gadgetbots later become a decent inclusion to Clank's puzzle-focused gameplay, but I wish Insomniac had given Clank himself some more utility than he has here. He can only jump, glide, and punch, 
and it feels like a missed opportunity. It's an underwhelming first showing for the sidekick. Ratchet gets the grind boots here, but doesn't actually get to use them properly for a couple of levels. This is a problem the game has in introducing new concepts to the player. This grind rail requires absolutely no input from the player. While this means they're introduced to the grind boots in the easiest way possible, it also means that the player doesn't get any active practice with them. The same is true of the prior clank section. It introduces the gadget box and lets the player briefly use their abilities, but they aren't used to solve any actual puzzles for a good few hours. I understand that Insomniac wanted to ease the player into these new concepts as simply as possible, but presenting them in a way that doesn't reflect how they'll later be put to use was not the best way to go about doing this. There's also a fairly easy boss here, which is nonetheless a good test to see if the player has gained sufficient skill with the game's weapons system to be capable of progressing further. Or you could just kill it with the wrench. The more interesting path is the flight to the ship with the big red button. Something's clearly off here from the start, with the camera angle being all off kilter. After pressing the button, a timer pops up and gives the player 45 seconds to escape. I like how brief the timer is, because it probably took longer than 45 seconds to get to the button, and it instills some small amount of panic in the player, despite the fact that it's actually fairly easy. Perhaps you didn't hear me. This is a little in a matter of seconds. Please evacuate. Next up is Rulgar and some Hydro Displacer puzzles which actually put the gadget to decent use the first time it's used. Along this path is the rising water section which still brings up some tense memories to this day. It's the only time in the game where the slow swimming speed and air meter are put to good use before being made obsolete by the Hydro Pack and O2 mask respectively, but I think the memories many people have of this challenging section were worth withholding swimming upgrades from the player. Ratchet and Clank find Captain Quark and are surprised to learn that he knows who they are. He tells Ratchet he wants to make him Captain Ratchet and asks them to meet him on Umbris at his headquarters. Before doing that though, the team can head over to the hoverboard races to win the grand prize. Along the way, this shady guy tries to sell Ratchet the Rhino rocket launcher, the most powerful weapon in the game. But it takes a solid three playthroughs to earn enough bolts, and in my opinion it makes the entire game, especially the final boss, far too easy. Obviously that's the entire point, and people who like to activate god mode cheats in games will likely love the Rhino. Your mileage will vary with this. Ratchet and Clank get to the hoverboard races, and are invited to take part. But first, um... Hmm. Huh. The hoverboard race itself is a decent little mini game and a good way for Insomniac to get some more use out of the solid skateboarding system they built for Spyro 3. It successfully avoids feeling like a carbon copy because of the futuristic thematic elements and the fact that Spyro's skateboarding was always in an open park, while Ratchet's is a linear race. It shows how developers can economise and effectively reuse systems they've already built just by making some simple changes to how they're presented. In both games, these are only mini-games, so we're never in much danger of wearing out their welcome anyway, and I think Insomniac were wise to recognise this. You can go back to Iridia and get the Sonic Summoner now, which summons sand mice from certain spots. It's a decent reward for those who remember to go back and get it, but it goes underutilised because of how sparse these mice are. This is probably because they deal quite a large amount of damage without any effort from the player, but they could have included more of these if the damage they deal had just been reduced. Quark's headquarters are the next stop, and the duo now have to head through a gauntlet. Umbris is the first level, excluding the very first, to only include one path and one objective. I don't think this is because of any development issues, but simply because the team had an overabundance of ideas for level themes, which in this case is no bad thing. That's just a guess though, and I could be completely off base. Nevertheless, this level contains an important story beat, so it's good that it keeps the pace up. This point, with all the fences in the turret, looks particularly difficult, but you can actually just do this. Oh, 
I'm pretty certain this was unintentional, but it's one of very, very few glitches I can reliably pull off, so I won't hold it against the team for letting this one slip through. This area puts the Hydro Displacer to further use, and it's one of my favourite puzzles in the game. It's not particularly hard to figure out or very challenging, but getting to teach these giant fish a lesson is rather enjoyable. It's a nice touch that they have a unique flopping animation if they land on solid ground rather than in shallow water. Captain Quark betrays the duo here, and while it's not exactly Shakespeare, it's a decent plot twist for a G-rated platformer made in 2002. In fact, it might be the only plot twist in a G-rated platformer made in 2002. The Snaggle Beast fight that follows integrates standard combat and a unique boss gimmick reasonably well. But the most interesting development in this level is the deteriorating relationship between Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet blames Clank for nearly getting them killed by trusting Captain Quark too much and dragging him into the Snaggle Beast pit, and wants revenge on Quark. Clank, on the other hand, thinks Ratchet is being selfish, and that they should be focused on stopping Drek, who's still busy destroying entire planets. Again, it's nothing astounding, but I feel it's the part of the plot that is the most interesting. It doesn't actually have all that much relevance, but the fact that it's unnecessary but included anyway makes it stand out compared to the rest of the plot, which mainly exists to push the characters forward. It'd be fair to say that there are very few buddy platformer games where the buddies hate each other for a good third of the game. I don't want to talk too much more about the plot, as it's clearly not the focus, but I thought this aspect in particular was worth expanding on. Planet Battalia is the next stop, and this is where the first proper grind boot section takes place. It's about as good as you could expect, pretty easy but enjoyable. This level gives me a good excuse to discuss the game's music. Ratchet and Clank doesn't necessarily have the catchiest tunes ever created for a video game, but I do think it has a feel all its own. You may not be able to hum any one Ratchet tune off the top of your head, but the overall soundscape of the game is instantly recognisable no matter which level you're playing. This is thanks to the excellent composition of David Burgoad, who scored all the Ratchet games up to and including Quest for Booty. He also scored Insomniac's first game, the Doom Clone Disruptor, and their first PS3 game, Resistance Fall of Man, which, being a military shooter, actually has a very similar musical feel to Battalia, the military planet. For comparison, Resistance's title menu music versus Battalia's background music. The other path here takes Ratchet and Clank to the Commander, but they can't do anything about his predicament until they find some Magna Boots, which aren't located on this planet. A detour then to planet Gaspar, the second planet with only one required path. Off to the side here though is a lengthy and well fleshed out path to a gold bolt, which also includes a secondary objective of destroying all these Blarg gunships. This path seems to have had an awful lot of effort put into it just for a collectible, so I wonder if at some point in development this was going to be a second mandatory path for this level, or perhaps a path to a weapon that ended up being bought at a Gadgetron vendor in the final game. It seems fairly likely, but I can't imagine why it would have been changed to an ancillary collectible like this. The path is only 5 minutes long, so I wouldn't imagine it had anything to do with the pacing of the game, but this is something that sticks out to me as the end result of some form of development issue. Gaspar's main path is fairly straightforward, so I'll take this opportunity to talk about the game's health system, known as Nanotech. In this first game, Ratchet's health is represented by four nanotech orbs at the top of the screen. No matter which enemy or attack hits him, he always loses one and only one of these orbs. The system is exactly the same as how Spyro took damage in all three Spyro games, though now represented on the heads up display rather than in game where it was represented in Spyro in the Dragonfly Sparks' colour. 
I think this detail is a step back from Spyro. If a HUD element can be integrated into the game world without feeling forced, it should be. There's an extremely easy way this could have been done too. Clank's bright green eyes, almost always facing towards the camera, could have changed from green to blue to yellow to red before death. This seems so incredibly obvious that I'd imagine this was the original intent of the development team, but they had to change it to a HUD element when it was decided that Ratchet would be able to upgrade his health to 5 and later 8 hit points. 8 colours would have been a stretch to trust younger players to keep track of, but I do wish the team had found a way to integrate health into the game world like they did with Spyro. Later games had a very light RPG system attached to health. Ratchet could level up his health and gain more hit points and enemies dished out different amounts of damage depending on their intended difficulty. I don't think either system is any better or worse, just different. The way the sequels handled health did allow the Ratchet series to feel more like its own thing rather than Spyro 2.0, but I'm glad that at least one Ratchet game experimented with this first game style of health. We head to Orcs on next and we get to play our second and last Clank level. There's a couple of door puzzles here that put the Gadgetbots to use, and the goal becomes getting the Gadgetbots, which can't jump, through the stage without losing any. As such, the gameplay here is actually more about the Gadgetbots than Clank himself, and while these sections are well designed for what they are, they are essentially escort missions. And again, in my opinion, the whole focus of the Clank sections was misplaced. These sections should have instead been designed around giving Clank himself some more interesting utility. This does of course depend on your enthusiasm towards escort missions, but for a game called Ratchet and Clank, Clank doesn't get much of an opportunity to shine. Clank picks up the Magna Boots here and the stage loops around on itself for the first time, with the ship being just below this point. Orkson's level design is particularly clever and interconnected, with each path looping back to the ship and opening up shortcuts very smoothly as we'll continue to see as more paths open up in this level. The next part of this level is Clank's last, and has him guiding even more Gadgetbots around the level avoiding hazards. I've said all I have to say about these sections, so suffice to say that Clank finds the next Infobot and the stage again loops around on itself very nicely to return Clank to the ship. After exchanging sick burns, Perhaps the extra oxygen will help your brain to function properly. Yeah, and maybe the salt water will rust your mouth shut. The duo head to Pokotaru. They can also return to Batalia to destroy the gunships now that they have the Magnum Boots, but it's not required and the reward is a pretty useless metal detector. Upon arriving on Pokotaru, off on a side path is this guy, who will exchange the Persuader for some Raritanium found on planet Hoven. The Persuader gives significant discounts on weapon purchases at Gadgetron vendors, so it's a nice reward for those who go out of their way to get it, especially considering the base prices of some of the late game weapons. The main path through the level is an escort mission where you have to help this guy through the stage, although all this really means is that the player has to kill all the enemies in each area before moving on, since he can't take damage. I've always found the little pufferfish enemies here to be fairly difficult, but that might just be because I forget to use the suck cannon. The thruster pack is required to push this button to open the door to the fighter jet. It's not the most elegant way to force the player to buy it, and the thruster pack adds nothing that couldn't simply have been incorporated into the Halipax moveset, so I do question why this upgrade was made compulsory at all. Personally, I much prefer the thruster pack to the helipack from a visual standpoint, but it's a questionable requirement at this stage in the game. The fighter jet minigame here is about as good as every other minigame, that is to say, decent enough and successful in briefly mixing up the gameplay. With the O2 mask in hand, we can now return to Orkson, where we'll be playing as Ratchet this time. These sleeping enemies here are a particularly devious inclusion. They won't be woken up unless the player touches them, or attacks them, or something near them, but instinct might lead the player to attack them anyway. Leaving them sleeping means they won't attack, but if the player has to attack something else while in the middle of them, they're liable to get swarmed. It's an interesting dilemma, taken advantage of through the little flying blue creatures which must be killed to prevent them from waking up the sleeping enemies. Here Ratchet can get some premium nanotech, increasing the player's hit points by one. The effect on the game's difficulty doesn't amount to much, but it's nice that this is optional. Players who want a stiffer challenge can choose to spend these bolts on weaponry instead. 
The level design here again makes Auxon stand out as it loops around to the area previously visited as Clank. This part here cleverly induces a second of panic in the player as they land among a bunch of sleeping enemies. All the player has to do is jump over them, but in the moment the player might panic and attack one, setting them all off. Ratchet and Clank find an infobot for Hoven where Drek is planning to launch a missile that can destroy an entire planet. After the level design loops around on itself nicely one last time, the duo head for Hoven to stop the bomb launch. Hoven is where I'll talk a little about the strafing, and lack thereof, in the first Ratchet game. This first game's gunplay is in dire need of the ability to strafe, or in other words, sidestep. Think along the lines of how a third or first person shooter typically controls when aiming. The character steps to the side while aiming forwards rather than turning their entire body and aiming in a different direction. I'm showing some short footage of strafing in Ratchet and Clank 2 to demonstrate. The first game doesn't give you any ability to strafe at all until you get the hover pack, which allows you to hover just off the ground and strafe just fine. At an educated guess, the developers likely realised that strafing was necessary very, very late into development and didn't have the time to animate Ratchet's torso facing in one direction while his legs moved in another. An easy fix to this issue was to implement strafing into a gadget that allowed Ratchet to hover off the ground slightly, the thruster pack. Little to no extra animation work was necessary for this to work, since Ratchet's body itself doesn't need to animate while hovering, and strafing could be added at the last second. This was some pretty resourceful thinking on the part of the dev team, and is likely the reason why the thruster pack was a required purchase. The player gets the thruster pack very late into the game though, making the strafing too little too late. I'd say that, given even just another fortnight of development, the team at Insomniac would have found a way to give the player the ability to strafe much, much earlier, perhaps by swapping the order of the hover pack and helipack. Given another couple of months, they might have even done some more animations and given it to the player from the start, as it is in all the sequels. It could also be that they were again trying to dole out new moves slowly to avoid overwhelming the player, but if this is the case it was a poor choice, given how much it would have improved the game's lasting appeal to have strafing available from the start. Ratchet and Clank shoot down the bomb and get the Hydra Pack here, which notably is never actually required to progress the main story, only a few side objectives. There's an ice section that mixes up the movement mechanics, but it's brief enough that it gets off lightly compared to a lot of other ice levels and games. The two also finally find some Raritanium, which we can then give to the inventor to get the Persuader and that sweet Gadgetron discount. Altanus Orbit is the last level in the game with only one objective. The player has to have the Devastator or Visibomb gun to get anywhere in this stage, so the developers can now assume the player has at least one of those weapons, and this is reflected in some enemy designs we'll come to later. This moment, where the player is on the roof and can see the huge amount of enemies below, is a pretty cool way of making the player wonder if they're really going to have to fight all of those before promptly dropping them into the thick of it in answer. There's a spot late in the level where the player seems to have no option but to take damage, and that's always struck me as rather sloppy design, but a situation like this doesn't happen at any other point in the game, so it's a minor slip-up. Ratchet finally gets his chance to take down Quark, and for some reason this boss battle is done as a dogfight like the earlier one on Pokotaru. As such, it comes across less like a boss fight and more like a minigame, and it's not testing the player on any of the base skills they've spent the entire game learning. Ratchet and Clank doesn't have a lot of bosses as it is, and making this one so divorced from the majority of the gameplay only serves to bring that issue into focus. If there'd been a few more bosses, this would have been forgivable, but as it is I think the game would have been better served with an on-foot Quark battle. After getting his revenge on Quark, Ratchet finally, and somewhat redundantly, sees how selfish he's been and how Drek has gone too far in his relentless destruction of planets. The duo make up and set off for Altanus to track down Drek. There's a hidden opportunity to get some gold weapons before challenge mode here, but I won't be buying any because the good ones are out of my price range. It's good to have the option though. Altanus is the first and only time outside of the first level where Ratchet has to go it alone, as the storm is messing with Clank's circuitry. This path here takes full advantage of this, with ice floors and strong winds. 
Earlier on Hoven, I used Clank's glide move to correct myself if I was about to slide off the ice. But as this isn't an option here, the player's first instinct to jump will only serve to get them killed faster. It's hard to say whether removing Clank or adding more ice sections came first in the concept stages for this level, but the combination makes this the best level for the ice sections to make their only reappearance in. The Magna Boot paths here are a bit frustratingly long, but this is another element that we'll see a fix in the sequels. Ratchet finds Steve after the ice section and grabs the Morpho Ray following this poor progenitor to the obligatory stealth section. And there's a very difficult swing shot gold bolt path here that subscribes well to the idea of the hardest optional challenge being harder than the hardest required challenge. Moving on to planet Core 2, there's an optional swimming section here that leads to the bolt grabber. Swimming sections get a lot of flack in platformers, but I think Ratchet and Clank pulls them off well. The O2 mask removes the breath meter, and the hydro pack allows Ratchet to swim at speed, so two common problems of swimming sections are eliminated by this point in the game. The timer pushes the player forward, and essentially these sections come across as fairly straightforward platforming obstacle courses, where the jump is replaced with freer y-axis movement. This level leads to the next mini-game, some close quarters combat with Giant Clank. This section demonstrates my point that I talked about during the regular Clank sections earlier. This is the kind of focus normal size Clank should have received in his sections. Here, we're playing as Clank through and through, as he achieves all the carnage. In the earlier sections, the Gadgetbots were the ones making progression possible by opening all the doors, and Clank was only guiding them along. Giant Clank may be the complete antithesis to how Clank normally appears, but his gameplay gives Clank more of a spotlight than he ever gets at normal size. We can't progress through the other path in this level yet, so it's lucky that the Giant Clank fight netted us some coordinates to the Gadgetron headquarters, exactly where we need to go to get the Hologuys. As this level begins, the elite commando enemies are introduced. These enemies take advantage of the earlier requirement to have the Devastator or Visibomb gun, by both having large amounts of health and the ability to hover. You can beat these enemies with other weapons, but they seem so purpose-built for the Devastator that I can understand why the developers decided to make it mandatory a few levels prior. You can actually skip one of the paths in this level with some clever use of the Visibomb gun. This seems unintentional, but there's always the possibility that the devs who built the laser walls were aware of this trick and decided to leave it in for clever players to find. I'll of course be doing the legitimate path through the stage though. Over here, there's a reasonably challenging grind rail section with the map matic waiting at the end to augment that map screen that no one ever uses. Later. Clank tries his hand at flirting, I think she likes me. and we can visit the Gadgetron break room, no surprises there, before heading off on the crucial path. These test chambers where Gadgetron test dummies use the same weapons as the player are a neat idea, although I would have liked to see more weapons used by the enemies. There's also another hoverboard race here, and then it's back to Core 2. This section is a great addition because of how it forces the player to be patient and sneaky where, for the rest of the game, they've been loud and obvious. It challenges the player's self-control, and is well placed at a late stage in the game when the player has had time to build up gameplay instincts that they will have to ignore to get through this part. It turns out that Drek is now planning to blow up Ratchet's home planet. He claims this is because it occupies the perfect orbit, but I've always gotten the impression that it's secretly to get revenge on Ratchet and Clank for screwing up so many of his plans. Though reading deeply into the motivations of Ratchet and Clank villains might be a bit of a stretch. There's another quality swimming section here on Drek's ship, but sadly the reward just unlocks a gold bolt on another planet, which can't compare to the utility of the bolt grabber from the last one. This level reuses the Hologuys a bit too quickly after the last level, but as the game is wrapping up now, there wasn't anywhere else to reuse it without changing around the game's progression significantly. There's a small piece of really great design here that teaches the player that dogs aren't fooled by the Hologuys. It's in a safe environment and without a tutorial pop-up, which would have been condescending in the penultimate level. Getting around these dogs and robots at the same time is an excellent way to use the Hologuys to its full potential.
The duo discover that Drek is on Velden, which they probably could have reasonably assumed without coming to this level at all, and we finally return to where we started. The advantages of placing this level both at the start and end of the game are immediately obvious on the moment of arrival. The cheerful yellow skies of the beginning of the game are contrasted now with a foreboding red, and the music has also changed to something suitably ominous. Flipping the atmosphere of the area on its head like this creates an instinctive sense that this is the final level, and seeing a familiar level warp like this is surprisingly unsettling. The commando enemies are out in full force here, making progress through the level rather slow. At points it does feel like overkill, but this is the final level, and it never crosses over into being unfair as long as you're patient. There's one more use of the Hydro Displacer here to justify its existence, and then we get to this very interesting gold bolt. All you have to do is use the taunter to lure the enemy onto the button, but the first time I played this I stood here for minutes wondering what the hell I was supposed to do, since the taunter is otherwise so useless. I would have liked to see more gold bolts hidden like this, requiring the use of specific weapons to access, since this is a really good idea but can be frustrating because of the lack of precedent for it. There's a really good moment here designed to make the player feel a lot of conflicting emotions in a very short span of time. When you emerge out here, you see a completely ridiculous amount of enemies. You wonder if you're going to have to fight them all, and feel exasperated and perhaps even annoyed because you've spent an entire level slowly taking out a bunch of these guys already. Go off to the side here though, and lo and behold, there's a giant clank pad. These enemies have been putting up a significant challenge and giving you grief for multiple levels now, so it's massively satisfying to smash through all of them like they're nothing. When developers and players talk about moments of catharsis, this is how it's done. The final battle with Drek is now upon us, and I've always liked his explanation of his motivations. In a game where the villain has been building a planet from bits and pieces of other planets, I've always found it surprisingly funny to finally hear that his true motivation is something as base as wanting to be rich. Maybe that's just me. This boss can actually be very difficult if you don't have the rhino or any gold weapons. The game has had a dearth of good boss battles that test the player's skill at the base gameplay up to this point, so it's fitting that Drek puts up such a good fight. The fight does highlight an issue with the weapon arsenal, in that there aren't many good choices for projectile weapons to hit him with since he hovers off the ground, but I can see why giving him legs, or the player more options, might have unbalanced this fight and made it easier than Insomniac intended. The fact that he initiates a countdown which the player must turn off is a particularly nice touch as it shifts the player's focus to turning off the countdown while still requiring them to concentrate on avoiding the boss's attacks. It's also the only time in the game when the thruster pack slam down is put to good use. The player gets to slam down the planet buster button for one last hurrah. And after a surprisingly heartfelt ending, hey, tin can. <laughs> where do you think you're going? We uh, still need to fix that arm. That ends Ratchet and Clank. When writing this review, I was surprised to find how often I was making comparisons between Ratchet and & Clank and Spyro the Dragon. In hindsight, it's not that surprising that there would be some carryovers, considering the excellent work Insomniac did on Spyro before doing excellent work on Ratchet. But today it's easy to see why many believe that the series only truly found its stride and stepped out of the shadow of Spyro with the release of the second game. As a result, it's easy to be negative about this first game and only see the flaws. It has absolutely aged considerably worse than any of its sequels, with the strafing being a particular sticking point. But if only for kicking off a franchise that is still going strong 13 years and two console generations later, Ratchet & Clank must have been doing something right. <laughs>